good morning if you are in the west coast like myself uh and maybe near i haven't asked him whether he's here in the west coast or in italy today uh good afternoon if you are in the east coast like my colleague hassan umut who will be joining us in a minute uh, and good uh evening if you are across the ocean in central europe or further east in turkey uh my name is baki baki tezjan I teach uh, history at the University of California in Davis, and I convene the uh, online meetings of the Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association. Uh, I'm going to introduce to you uh, today's meeting and tell you just a bit about uh, what is uh, coming up in our programming in uh, the months ahead. Uh, so today we are here, as you all know, uh, to uh, celebrate, actually, the many achievements of Otto Confession, uh, the team uh, led by my colleague Tiana Kristic and Derin Terzioğlu. I'll, I'll tell their names one more time at the end with all of the participants. So I'm only here going to take a second to uh, announce our upcoming programming uh, next month, March, March 25th. Uh, we will discuss a companion to early modern Istanbul um, in a panel uh, that will be chaired by Umit Fırat Açıkgöz and Deniz Türker, uh, who are both close friends of uh, Yavuz Sezer, whom we lost last year to COVID. Uh, this book panel will be in his memory uh, with Shirin Hamade, Çidam Kapescioğlu, Selim Kuru, and Gülru Necipoğlu. And we will also uh, thank the contributors to the Yavuz Cesar article prize that has been created uh, to commemorate him, which is uh, going to be given for the first time this year. We'll have a small fundraising campaign around this event. So uh, keep that in mind and look for your inbox for uh, in information about it coming up. And then later in April, we'll have a co-op session uh, to celebrate the Ottoman History Podcast. They've been uh, actually over uh, a decade uh, with us all, uh, making our lives so much richer, uh, teaching uh, Ottoman history so much more lively uh, with uh, the tens uh, or hundreds maybe by now of, of, of um, the, the podcast that they made, uh, all of them, if you're not familiar with them yet. Uh, please check them out at ottomanhistorypodcast.com, but most probably all of you know Ottoman History Podcast better than you know what's up, uh, because uh, long, long, long before uh, we were trying to do, uh, you know, online programming, digital programming, Ottoman History Podcast showed us the way. Uh, so over a dozen of their contributors will be joining us and sharing their stories, and we'll be thanking them for making our field uh, so much more accessible to so many people around the world. And then in April, uh, in our WhatsApp uh, meeting, we will have Anna Sekulic, who uh, received last year a honorable mention in our article prize competition. And uh, she also received Mesa's uh, best dissertation award in humanities. So we'll talk about her work. Uh, Molly Green will be the moderator and uh, my colleague Heather Ferguson will be the discussant. Today, we are here again uh, to discuss Ottoman religious politics in the confessional age. Uh, the chairs, Tiana Kristic and Derin Terziolu, have been leading a research project for some years now. Tiana, as you all know, teaches at Central European University and Derin at Boazici University. They asked me specifically to keep the introductions just to the names and institutions, nothing more, because they have so much to share, and I will respect their wishes. Uh, so after Tiana and Devin, you will also hear from Polina Ivanova, Justus Liebig uh, uh, University, from, and Emesha Muntan from Central European University, Anna Ohanjanyan uh, from the Institute of Ancient Manuscripts, Matena Daran, uh, and Nir Shafir, UC San Diego, and Hassan Umut from McGill University. Tiana, please go ahead. Thank you, Baki, very much. Just a, a moment to try to share my PowerPoint. Um, is it showing? 
Yeah, okay. Um, let me just put it in the um, presentation mode. Okay. Um, so thank you, Baki, very much for uh, inviting us to present uh, on our project, uh, which, as it happens, officially ends today. So it is a very good moment to uh, reflect on it, even though, of course, it would have been nice to do that um, with a different background of daily events. Um, I would also like to thank um, everyone who joins us today. I saw uh, briefly a, a lot of people who uh, familiar faces, many of whom have contributed to the project in various ways over the last five years. Uh, so it's great to have a, a small reunion, even if it's online. Uh, so since we have a lot of ground to cover, uh, I will get to the point. Um, the auto confession is, uh, the acronym for the project, which was actually entitled The Fashioning of a Sunni Orthodoxy and the Entangled Histories of Confession Building in the Ottoman Empire between the 15th and 17th centuries, which was uh, fund, uh, funded by the European Research Council uh, Consolidator Grant. Um, and the project was hosted uh, by the Center for Eastern Mediterranean Studies in uh, Central European University, initially in Budapest and now in Vienna and carried out in partnership with Boazic University in Istanbul. Uh, we started this research uh, in 2015 and we were supposed to finish it in 2020, uh, but due to the pandemic, um, the project has been extended to February this year, which brings us to today. So um, what uh, was the project about or what has it been about? Um, our starting point has been the observation made already by several generations of Ottomans before us, namely, um, but not studied in detail, namely that um, in the early 16th century, the religious outlook of the Ottoman sultans and the imperially sponsored hierarchy of religious scholars underwent a shift. While until now they were largely unconcerned with defining, observing and enforcing a Sunni orthodoxy and orthopraxy, they now became increasingly invested in precisely such a project. Now, in, in the past, as you know, scholars have speculated that this was due to the influx of the uh, Arab Sunni scholars into the Ottoman learned hierarchy um, in the aftermath of the Ottoman conquest of the Mamluk domains in 1516-17, while others looked east uh, to the uh, Safavid challenge um, and uh, tried to explain um, the, this uh, rising um, sensitivity or sens uh, new, new, new uh, uh, sensitive sensibility towards uh, orthodoxy uh, as a, um, a ref uh, result of the uh, Safavid challenge and onset of conversions to uh, Shiism in heretofore Sunni Iran. Now, in both cases, uh, scholarship has not explored in depth the nature of this new Ottoman vision of Sunni orthodoxy and whether there was something distinctly early modern about it. So we envisioned two main lines of inquiry when we started this project. Um, the first um, question was how and why did the Ottoman Empire evolve from what historiography has characterized as a syncretic and heterodox 14th century polity where ambiguity between Sunnism and Shiism prevailed into a state concerned with defining and enforcing a Sunni orthodoxy and um, uh, by the early 16th century. Was, well, what was the nature of this Sunni orthodoxy and how did the Ottoman discourse on it evolve over the subsequent centuries? Now, the second uh, question, uh, kind of thinking more broadly, was whether this phenomenon was in any way related to or in dialogue with political, religious political developments in other religious communities in the Ottoman Empire and beyond during the early modern era, specifically with a similar drive towards articulating orthodoxies and confessional boundaries that we see in Europe at the same time. Um, now, this first set of questions drew on Derin and my expertise as scholars on, uh, of early modern Ottoman uh, intellectual and religious history and required us to explore um, the meaning of the Sunni tradition in both diachronic and synchronic perspectives. Here we were joined um, by other members of the team, most notably Nir Shafir, Selim Güngörüler, uh, Dünhan Börekçi, Damla Gürkananar, and many others uh, along the way um, to explore how these conditions for belief uh, and practice, as well as thinking about what it meant to be a Muslim and a member of the Muslim community, changed between the 15th and 18th centuries 
in the Ottoman Safavid context, in part as a consequence of the empire building processes. And in conversation with other colleagues, many of whom are also present here, uh, who worked on related topics, we offered our insights uh, in the first deliverable of the project, so-called deliverable, um, the edited volume uh, entitled Historicizing Sunni Islam in the Ottoman Empire between the 1450, circa 1450 to circa 1750, that uh, Darin will talk about um, uh, shortly. Now, the second uh, uh, set of questions opened up a comparative and entangled perspectives and entailed cooperation with the scholars working on Christian and Jewish communities living both in the Ottoman Empire and beyond. And we were particularly interested here in the question of whether Ottoman Christian and Jewish communities experienced a similar shift towards a concern with articulating a notion of orthodoxy and orthopraxy. And if they did, why? Were such concerns a reaction to in, uh, and in dialogue with similar concerns among both Ottoman Muslims and as well as among um, as well as other various communities in Europe, Russia, and the Safavid Empire, whose missionaries uh, had access to Ottoman subjects, for instance. Uh, in this line of inquiry, we were uh, particularly uh, ben we particularly benefited from the research of experts in Armenian, Greek, as well as Catholic missionary sources. Most notably, Anna Ohanjanian, Margarita Vulgaropoulou, Alex Tudorie, um, Emma Shemuntan, Henry Shapiro, Paolo Luca, and others. Um, uh, and we presented then these insights we collectively arrived at um, in the second sort of uh, deliverable of the project, namely the volume in entitled Entangled Confessionalizations? Question mark. Um, it has a longer title, you'll see it in a moment, uh, which will be published uh, within the next month or so, and which we will also briefly present in a moment. Um, uh, finally, to ensure that we do not leave behind just our own interpretations of the sources, which may or may not age well, we'll see. Our third ma major deliverable is a collection of sources in translation uh, from various languages of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, many of these sources, which we will be compiling in this source book, uh, were actually used by all of us uh, who, who contributed to the first and second volume, um, to, and they highlight early modern Jewish and Christian discourses on um, communal belonging, orthodoxy, and orthopraxy, as well as confessional ambiguity uh, through the framework of a shared confessional age. And we are particularly happy in this respect that uh, Polina Ivanova and Hassan Mut joined the team uh, towards the end of our work uh, and were able to um, uh, lend their expertise in the process of editing the source book, which continues now beyond the end of this uh, project uh, and which they will also present on uh, shortly in greater detail. Um, so today we organized this presentation according to these three main uh, deliverables and some of the team members who contributed to them. Uh, but a full list of all team members publications can be seen can be seen here um, on the website of the Center for Eastern Mediterranean Studies, um, which we are still updating. Uh, so please check in over time and all of these things will be in open access so you will be able to uh, see them and consult them as soon as they are out. Um, so without further ado, I turn over the word to Derin. Thank you. Um, I guess I cannot move the, so you will need to move it, Tiana, right? Hmm, thank you. So thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, Baki, for inviting us. Uh, and uh, thank you to all the team members. Uh, and uh, if I may, <laughs> um, thank you to Tiana uh, for making the last, um, was it now, is it now seven years almost? <laughs> Six and a half? years uh, uh, meaningful despite uh, everything uh, coming together to make it quite unbearable. Uh, yeah, you have been a real source of sustenance. So allow me to make this unprofessional uh, remark. Um, so anyway, uh, let me then uh, talk about uh, our first deliverable, the, the, uh, the book uh, volume, Historicizing Sunni Islam in the Ottoman Empire, 1450 to 1750. I'd like to say uh, first a few words about the production process. Uh, 
This book originated in a workshop we held uh, at uh, CEU in Budapest uh, in, 2000, in the summer of 2017, Rethinking Ottoman Sunnitization, in between the same dates. Um, uh, basically, uh, not everyone who participated uh, in the workshop ended up contributing to the volume, and not everyone who contributed to the volume was in the original uh, workshop. Nevertheless, the majority of the original contributors uh, stayed on board uh, during the three long years it took to bring the book to completion, and we're grateful uh, for that. I emphasize this because uh, from the beginning, uh, we wanted this workshop and uh, the book publication process to be an occasion for us uh, to uh, not just present our research, uh, but to uh, exchange ideas and, uh, uh, and, and engage in discussions and rethink the premises, uh, sources, approaches of our respective uh, research. Um, and, um, and, and this is why all the papers were, were distributed uh, before the workshop, uh, uh, leaving plenty of time for discussions. And the conversations basically continued after the workshop, um, as each of us <laughs> rewrote uh, our uh, contributions in the light of all the uh, rich comments uh, we got uh, from each other. Um, the commentators and the anonymous uh, reviewers. <clears throat> Um, now, so much about the production process of, of the book. Um, as for its contents, um, I guess the title uh, uh, emphasizes uh, the most important uh, aim that we had in the, in the volume, which was to historicize understandings and practices of Sunni Islam in the Ottoman Empire, if you like to see whether one can talk about such a thing as Ottoman Sunnism in the early modern period. <clears throat> Um, it was especially crucial for us to, uh, to demonstrate, uh, uh, if we had a common goal, uh, that the Sunni Muslim uh, tradition was not frozen in time, that the Ottomans did not just inherit and uh, pass on a fixed set of legal, theological doctrines, but rather rethought diverse strands of the Muslim legal, theological uh, tradition, uh, uh, in light of the changing concerns, uh, uh, needs, and sensibilities of, of their own times. This was why more than a third of the book was uh, devoted to what might be called um, the, 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 what might be called Ottoman intellectual history, uh, to a study of the Ottoman reception and uh, reception of and responses to the scholarly legacy of uh, uh, pre-Ottoman uh, times, uh, early Islam, you know, pre-Ottoman Islamic history, to put it in a very Ottoman-centric uh, way, sorry. Uh, and, uh, and of course, we couldn't cover all the different fields, but we did manage to cover a variety of them, uh, from Hadith transmission to dogmatics, to heresiography, to uh, jurisprudence, to even a degree of uh, political theory. Um, so the first two questions, in some sense, uh, that we address were very much addressed in the essays in that a volume. How did the Ottomans engage with the diverse trends of the Sunni Muslim uh, learned tradition? And how did wider social political dynamics and processes impact the ways they interpreted and applied Sunni norms over the centuries? Um, if I may uh, then maybe skip the other questions and go on to look at the, um, yeah, thank you. Um, so, uh, so you can see that the questions about how the Ottomans engage with the past and the, in, in dialogue with the present as informing especially the essays in the first part. Um, then uh, changing forms of religious practice uh, was another important focus, perhaps a second important focus of, of the volume especially the essays in part two, but also Guy Burak's essay at the end of part one, um, explore changes in debates and conflicts about and attempts to reshape Ottoman religious practices, uh, such as supplications, dua, um, congregational prayers, uh, salat and Sufi rituals. Uh, bringing together evidence from diverse uh, uh, written and material sources and combining the approaches of legal history, history of architecture and social history broadly 
um, uh, the essays in the second part of the volume uh, gave insights, especially into the implementation of what one might call Ottoman policies of Sunnitization or Sunni confession building. Uh, finally, the essays in the third and last section of the book uh, address the limits of Ottoman Sunnitization or Sunni confession building. Um, again, you know, we couldn't be comprehensive, but uh, Aisha Baltajola Bremer's essay examined how social, political, economic exigencies enabled the Kizilbash, particularly in the borderland areas, to carve a space for themselves in the Ottoman imperial landscape, despite uh, uh, the restrictions uh, placed on them and despite their marginalization in all kinds of ways. Interestingly, the last two essays focused instead on how members of the Ottoman learned and, uh, and uh, imperial elites themselves uh, twisted, blurred, complicated, and in some ways went beyond the discursive boundaries of normative Sunnism in the realms of historiography and diplomacy in specific contexts. So if I may go now to my uh, last uh, slide, I'll just talk about my own work in the, uh, in the framework of the uh, Otto Confession uh, project, and not just in the context of this uh, volume, but just very briefly. Um, actually, my, my uh, publications have gone in a number of different uh, directions in that time period. I just listed these four uh, published uh, or in press uh, articles. Uh, and basically, uh, one of my, you know, I, I've worked both on the 16th and 17th centuries, and uh, one of my interests has been uh, uh, the role of Sufis as agents of Sunnitization, and in, in, the, in this one uh, article on uh, Kurumi, power, patronage, and confessionalism, I was interested particularly in the interplay between Sunni confessionalism, patronage relations, and imperial politics uh, in the context of the 16th century. In this first volume that I just talked about, I uh, uh, discussed the Ottoman adaptation of the, of the Imtaymian doctrine, uh, the, uh, the Hanbali scholar Imtaymiyah's doctrine of al siyasa al-Sharia to the 16th century Ottoman context. And I was interested in um, change and continuity in juristic thought uh, uh, from the Memluk to the Ottoman context, and also change and continuity in Ottoman religious and legal culture from the 16th to the 17th century. Um, I also continue to examine the role of uh, 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 Sufis in juristic debates, specifically about debates on orthopraxy, and lastly, in the second volume, um, I, I, I uh, tried to put together, you know, the ongoing discussions about Ottoman Sunnitization, confession building, and the discussions on uh, continued confessional ambiguity. And I talked about, on the one hand, the interrelation between philo and Sufism, and on the other hand, the definition, redefinition of boundaries uh, allowed for confessional ambiguity and allowed for uh, philo and philo Sufism in the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, so um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Derenjim. Uh, stop sharing and uh, I'll give it over to Nir. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. My name is Nir Shafir. I'm a historian at the University of California in San Diego. Um, and two little things. First, I just want to thank uh, Tiana and Derin for having me, for asking me to represent, I guess, the Muslim side of the uh, project. Uh, I was also a postdoc in this project, um, which is, I guess, why I'm speaking here. Uh, and I also want to say that Tiana and Derin were both excellent, excellent uh, advisors, and I really learned um, an am amazing amount uh, through their guidance during the course of this project. I also want to say that every essay in this book is um, very, very heavily edited. There are no scraps of, you know, someone's leftover conference presentation here. Everything, all, at least my essay, went through eight revisions under their hands. And so you can think about everything here as um, a very, it's not your ordinary edited volume, basically. It's a very good volume, so check it out. Uh, I'm gonna speak very briefly about my little contribution here, which was to call a little piece called How to Read Heresy in the Ottoman World. I had other piece, articles that were uh, generously sponsored by the uh, project, which I won't talk about 
Uh, this is one of them, uh, Moral Revolutions in uh, CSSH. Uh, there's also this law, Islamic Law and Society piece in, called Vernacular Legalism. And uh, also there is this one about the Ottoman uh, Holy Land in Hajj. All of them are open access thanks to this project. So thank you, Tiana, for funding that. Um, but this is going to be, this was my little chapter. And I basically had uh, two questions that I wanted to see through here, which is one, how did the Ottoman dynasty come up with new definitions of heresy in the 16th century? And uh, two is how did actually this, these ideas of heresy circulate through the society? So rather than just seeing it as, you know, a response to the Kizilbash and the Safavids, uh, how did heresy move from the frontier to the Ottoman cities and then further abroad? Uh, and the way I did it is by looking at something called heresiographies. Uh, it's essentially a genre called Malal wa Nahal. It's an old medieval, medieval Arabic uh, genre. And the whole point of it, based on a hadith, is to identify 72 heretical sects of Muslims. And ideally, the one elect sect, which is usually the Sunnis. Now, there's different ways of doing this. Usually, authors identify kind of major branches of Harajis and Mutazalis and other things. Uh, but the most famous one is this one called by Al Shahrastani, a 12th century scholar who wrote uh, the eponymous Malal wa Nahal. Malal wa Nahal, this means uh, sects and religions. Now, what's interesting is that in uh, medieval Anatolia, in the frontier land of the Ottomans, from which the Ottomans came from, the heresiography was basically dead. No one really wrote any new ones. And of course, people read them because we can look in this Bayezid catalog. Uh, from the library, and we can see that they had them, but they character, uh, categorized them as histories. So they were stuffed in between Al-Biruni's description of India and a book about horses. So they were really about uh, understanding uh, how the world was ordered, not about identifying um, you know, heresies in the world. But this changed basically in the 16th century, uh, almost directly in response to the Safavids. You basically have a variety of Ottoman statesmen, uh, Lutfi Pasha, Kamal Pasha, Zadeh, uh, people like him, like them, uh, starting to write heresiographies. They went to actually Central Asian models and they adopted them to the new environment. Now, when I say adopted, what they did is they did not list new heresies. So they did not start talking about things like the Kizilbash or the Safavids or weird Sufi sects or antinomian groups. Instead, they kept all the medieval uh, heresies intact. Uh, which makes it very hard to be used as a source to figure out, well, how did people use heresy or how did it adopt in the Ottoman period? Because they just kept everything as it was. What they ultimately did, uh, or we can see if we analyze it closely through philological tools, is that they uh, basically emphasized different heresies that uh, tended to turn the leader into divinity, which was a common uh, accusation against the Safavids. But what's more interesting is the heresiographies that come in the 17th century. Uh, and they were really spurred by the second and third Ottoman Safavid Wars that basically, as you can see, went from 1603 to about 1640. Uh, and these were written in Turkish. They were written not by uh, state employees, but people often appealing for the state to take a stronger stance. And they're aimed at a wider public. And the most interesting one is the one by uh, Mohammed Amin Shirvani, who I'll speak about very quickly. Um, I don't want to get into this, but these are much more explicitly anti-Safavid, but they really don't change the actual structure. There's no, there's very little new heretical sects in all of these. Uh, and so to understand how they were used and why they were used differently, you have to look at the reception. I think this is perhaps one of the newer parts of this article. If you track uh, these heresiographies in miscellanies, you can find all sorts of stuff, for example, that uh, the one of Shirvani was used, uh, copied immediately after the Ottomans reconquered Baghdad. And they needed to know exactly who were these Muslims in this city, this former Safavid city, were they uh, heretics or not. Uh, the same could be interestingly said about all the other things that people read with these heresiographies. They read them in, now not about the Safavid, but they read them about uh, people who smoke tobacco, people who drink coffee, uh, a practice like saying you're part of the Milet Ibrahim or the religion of Abraham was often read alongside it. And all sorts of other Sufi practices now began to be grouped with these heresiographies, which shows you how the process of heresy moved from the Safavid borderlands into kind of Ottoman cities and urban culture. And in fact, heresiography modules start appearing in all sorts of texts, and they even get reduced to, for example, this one page on the left, uh, a one page kind of schematic breakdown of all the different medieval sects and what they kind of believed in. 
uh, and it was a sort of way of understanding the world. Uh, often it was accepted to divide the world into according to beliefs and sects. Um, of course, what's interesting is that it wasn't just Muslims who were interested in these heresiographies. They also attracted the attention of non-Muslims. So on the left, we actually see a Judeo-Turkish version of a heresiography, of Shirvani's heresiography. Uh, it's very difficult to read the script, but I worked with it a bit. And on the right is, a, is actually a heresiography module uh, put into Paul Rico's uh, The Present State of the Ottoman Empire. What's one of the most interesting things is how these, um, let's say, non-Muslim usages of heresiographies moved further still. Uh, so here's an example, actually, uh, which was brought to my attention by Tiana. So I thank her for showing me this. This is Shivani's heresiography, but translated into Italian by a Jew named Jacob Romano uh, in 1632 in Istanbul. And he presented it to the French ambassador in Istanbul. Now, what's interesting about this is that halfway through, when he's describing the elect sect and the right Muslims, he stops calling them Sunnis and starts calling them Catholics, Catholici. Um, and I think what this shows is just how um, the you know, Muslim world and the Christian world or either side of the Mediterranean was not divided by religion, but was united by a sort of confessionalized worldview in which both the Ottomans were fighting against their heretics and their uh, enemies, and the Catholics were fighting against the Protestants to the north. Um, and with that, I'll end. Uh, again, thank you to Tiana and Dering and everyone else for um, listening to me and for giving me this chance to be part of the project. Thank you, Neil, very, very much. Um, now we continue. Um, one second, if I can share um, this screen. Uh, yeah, uh, we are um, moving on. Um, with our second um, deliverable. So I will tell you a little bit about the second volume that is about to uh, come out, um, which um, also evolves from a conference, which was um, gathered in um, Budapest in 2018. And like the conference, the volume is entitled Entangled Confessionalizations? Question mark, Dialogic Perspectives on the Politics of Piety and community building in the Ottoman Empire from the 15th to the 18th centuries. And it is about to uh, come out uh, from uh, with, with George, uh, Gorgias Press. Uh, so this volume, as I mentioned, is um, our kind of response to our second major research question, namely whether the processes of defining an Ottoman Sunni Orthodoxy um, were related to or in dialogue with uh, religio-political developments in other religious communities, both in the Ottoman Empire and beyond during the early modern era. So with this uh, goal in mind, this volume explores how the new Muslim, Jewish, and Christian early modern discourses of communal belonging, um, orthodoxy, and orthopraxy manifested themselves, intersected, and interacted in the Ottoman uh, Empire. Um, our argument here, and I will um, um, show you the table of contents, uh, which is a bit hard to maybe read, but uh, uh, sorry for, for that. Um, the volume, as you can um, see um, from the titles of the papers, explores how, um, um, as I said, uh, the early modern Muslim, Jewish, and Christian early modern discourses interacted and intersected um, uh, in the Ottoman uh, Empire on these issues of, of uh, um, communal belonging, uh, orthodoxy and orthopraxy. And our argument here is that the representatives of various confessional groups in the Ottoman Empire articulated their notion of correct belief and or practice through both vertical kind of diachronic uh, engagement with their own particular tradition and through lateral or synchronic uh, engagement with the normative claims of other confessional communities. So rather than focusing only on what is kind of traditionally the historiography of non-Muslim communities um, on um, vertical top-down, bottom-up relations between Ottoman authorities and their subjects, uh, usually between a particular community and the Ottoman authorities, um, we are uh, here interested in um, um, exploring less commonly examined lateral um, relations between different Ottoman communities themselves, as well as how, as their encounters with uh, the external agents of orthodoxy and orthopraxy, such as Catholic, Lutheran, and Calvinist missionaries. 
In this way, the volume departs from this traditional historiographical approach to interfaith dynamics, um, uh, which is typically, typically limited to the single ethno-confessional community, as I said, uh, and its interaction with the Ottoman uh, state. Uh, now, in this uh, volume, we ask contributors, uh, as you see from the title, uh, to engage with the notion of confessionalization as a heuristic device. Um, as many of you know, the German historians Wolfgang Reinhardt and Heinz Schilling developed this concept in the, in the early 1980s in the context of historiography of the Holy Roman Empire to explain the societal impact of the parallel formation of confessional churches, namely Catholic, Lutheran, and Calvinist in the post Reformation period. And now our goal, uh, and I want to emphasize this very much, uh, with uh, engage, in engaging with the confessionalization, confessionalization thesis was not at all to apply this concept to uh, the historiography of the Ottoman Empire. Rather, the aim was to examine the utility of this concept and the robust debate that it generated, also criticisms of the thesis. Um, very notably, um, uh, for the for posing new questions and stimulating research into traditionally neglected sources penned by early modern Ottoman authors from various uh, um, communal uh, affiliations about uh, uh, religious beliefs and practices. And um, in, in in my own essay in this uh, uh, volume, which I think is probably the hardest thing I ever had to write. Um, uh, and that I struggled with a lot. Um, so I, I try to examine this utility of the concept of confessionalization from the perspective of Ottoman, different Ottoman communities and propose some alternative vocabulary. Uh, this essay also in a way summarizes the, um, the conclusions of our project. So I'd be very interested in coming weeks, months, uh, years to hear your feedback on this. Um, contributors were also free to completely reject the concept uh, and its utility if they didn't find it useful and to propose alternative uh, vocabulary, but ultimately our aspiration in this volume was to offer new insights into how forms of belief and uh, devotional practice became embedded into social and political dynamics in the Ottoman Empire in order to facilitate reconsideration of analytical vocabulary and frameworks which have been used to discuss politics of piety in early modern Eurasia. So um, sort of looking from the Ottoman Empire, both East and West, how, do, how can we rethink the, the analytical vocabulary we have used? Um, rather than organizing essays, as you can see here, also from the table of contents, according to commune, communities, so kind of a monocommunal approach, uh, we actually mix them up and uh, organize them around thematic sections, um, according to questions such as uh, visions and realities of authority, um, varieties of textual communities in the Ottoman arena of confessional polarization, polemical encounters in the interimperial um, perspective and contextual limits of confessional ambiguities to highlight the dialogue, the common challenges, the similarities, as well as differences in various Ottoman communities' experiences of uh, this confessional age. Um, and I would now like to turn the word over to Anna and Emesha, who um, can illustrate these points by talking about their own contribution to the volume, as well as about their research for the project in general. So. Um, Anna, why don't you um, yeah. take uh, Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tiana. I want to thank you, Tiana and Irene, for having me in this um, uh, project and for entrusting me to work with Armenian material within the project. Um, I also contributed to the volume. Tiana just um, um, presented, but I don't want to spoil it for those of you who have not read the, the article so that you go and re read when the volume is out. I'm going to briefly speak about my, um, my work within the project and the sources I consulted um, for the reconstruction of early modern, uh, of the confessional dynamics of Armenian uh, communities in early modern Ottoman and Safavid empires for uh, which I actually uh, joined the project. Um, revisiting the history of uh, Armenian communities in early modern period is very important today because um, in the domain of uh, Armenian studies, 
the early modern uh, is the least systematically studied historical period. And um, it's because of many reasons, but I will mention only couple of them. Partially it was and it is still is due to the tendencies in Armenian studies that put in ascendancy philological and linguistic research over others with a focus on late antiquity and medieval studies. And partially it is due to genocide studies gradually gaining momentum during recent decades. And as a result, the period between mid 16th uh, to um, early 19th centuries received relatively little scholarly attention and previous research was limited to the publication of historical and archival sources in Armenian mainly, while the material was uh, itself was predominantly contextualized within the liberation movements of the Armenians with little re reference to cross-communal exchange and in that analysis of modes of cohabita cohabitation with other nations. So the autoconfession project actually opened up uh, new entangled perspectives and provided new conceptual uh, tools for the study of confessional developments within Armenian communities and for uh, putting um, all these developments uh, into a broader context. The application of confessionalization paradigm to the Armenian case enabled to engage uh, theological sources along with the historical ones and doctrinal sources to put new bricks in construction and reconstruction of early modern Armenian social, confessional and political history. My research within the project aimed uh, among others to trace uh, the refashioning of the Armenian apostolic faith in the early modern period and its impact on political developments and vice versa, to discover to what extent and by whom the confessional boundaries of the Armenian apostolic faith were tested and what was the measures taken towards uh, redefining of the Armenian apostolic orthodoxy and orthopraxy. Then to reveal the transition of concepts across communal boundaries such as the concept of bad innovation uh, or bidat, and last but not least, to, re to rediscover confessional vocabulary utilized in intracommunal polemics uh, specific to the early modern period that served as a tool for indoctrination of the um, Armenian populace. And you can, I have produced artic uh, articles during the project. One of them is open access. You can see it on your screens. Um, as for the sources, the primary sources the research drew upon mostly involved catechism, doctrinal and liturgical works, encyclicals, neomartyrologies, but more importantly, polemical treatises that previously were deprived from the close attention of historians studying Armenian, um, the history of Armenian communities. My research proves that most of the polemical treatises deal with the confessional others, that is mainly Armenian Catholics. Um, very few works are dedicated to the polemics with Muslims, while the literary polemics with Jews is near to nothing. Another important thing is the language of the sources. In very rare occasions, it is a classical Armenian or grappar, usually pure classical Armenian, was used by very few authors in, in strictly a structured, tradition-oriented theological treatises. Other than that, the language of the polemics is uh, mainly a mixture of colloquial Armenian um, and Armeno-Turkish, Armeno-Greek, or Armeno-Persian, uh, depending on the nature, target, provenance of the source and its readership. One of such complicated yet very fascinating sources rediscovered, almost unearthed during my research is Yeremia Kyomurchan's polemical treatise, a titled Apology of the Armenian Church. It is one of the most catchy texts for someone like me who does historical theology, as it seems to be a corpus of all debatable topics on faith, popular religious practices, rights, as well as uh, orthodoxy um, about, and boundaries uh, or the orthodoxy and, of the orthodoxy and orthopraxy existing within Armenian communities in the Ottoman uh, lands, as well as addressed by um, neighboring Muslims and Jews to the Armenian community. I have found four copies of this treatise under different titles and attributed to different people. It is 
my current book project in the Institute of Ancient Manuscripts, thanks to the Otto Confession. And I mostly um, draw on the, um, uh, on the sources uh, that I actually discovered during the, the, uh, while I was uh, working within the project. I uh, work now on its critical edition. Uh, it will um, be out with a lengthy introduction in English that encapsulates, encapsulates a wider context and sets broader uh, timeframes. I hope to publish the book within two years and with a good publisher, it will be in English. Also some chapters and paragraphs of this treatise are translated into English for the Onto Confession source book with Paulina's great editorial help. But I think Paulina will speak more detailed on that topic. Um, thank you, that's it. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, and uh, I guess we move on to Emma Shedden. Yeah, I also want to thank Darin and Tiana and also Becky, of course, for this opportunity. And it was so nice to look over my screen and see some of the people I have literally haven't seen in years. And yes, it's, it's quite moving, actually, that now after we can say seven years, how much how much has happened and and how far uh, how far we have come so yeah actually yeah i was the newbie in the project i was a junior researcher uh, and then my phd research concentrated on catholic missionary activities uh, in 16th 17th century ottoman southeast europe and uh, in my dissertation which i defended at cu last june uh, I examined the plural manifestations of Catholicism in 17th century Ottoman Rumeli, and I focused on the territories of Bosnia, Slavonia, Srem, and the Banat. Uh, I specifically concentrated on how the sacramental reforms of the Council of Trent in terms of marriage and baptism were received and contested in this amazing region, which was religiously, ethnolinguistically, and legally very mixed and confusing to many. I engage with topics such as marriages of Catholics administered by Orthodox priests or Ottoman judges, the dynamics of Catholic Orthodox and Catholic Muslim mixed marriages, Catholic baptism of Muslim children in mixed marriages or baptism of Catholics by the, by the Orthodox priests. So if you're interested in any of these topics, my dissertation is the, is the, piece, to, is the piece to go to. Uh, so the findings of both the dissertation here, you can see it on the slide and the rest of my and the rest of my publications, both in English and in Hungarian, uh, highlighted the fact that Catholic missionaries in Northern Ottoman Rumeli, uh, Rumeli, similarly, of course, to other missionaries around the world, were not a homogenous group of agents of a reformed Catholicism. They differed in their strategies in approaching Ottoman Catholic, Protestant, and Orthodox Christians. And of course, in dealing with the overlapping jurisdiction of different Christian and, and Muslim authorities. And these differences would depend greatly on whether these missionaries originated from the region, like the Bosnian Franciscans, and if you will join later uh, the talk of Anna Sekulic, you will hear more about the Bosnian Franciscans who were very importantly legally Ottoman subjects themselves, or they were sent by Rome like most of the, most of the Jesuits. And what I in a way brought sort of a novelty and a different approach, and I tried to tell a different sort of history of this mission was the fact that besides these missionary agents, these traditional missionary agents, if you will, I have also looked closely at the roles of the local Ottoman Kadas and Serbian Orthodox priests in shaping the meaning of being a Catholic in Rumeli, especially through their involvement in the everyday lives of the, of the Catholic population and of course the local Christian population in general. Uh, so my paper in particular from the, from the volume, from the Entangled Confessionalizations volume, 
examine the role of these of these local Serbian Orthodox priests called pops and uh, Ottoman judges in the administration of marriages and divorces of Catholics in the mentioned regions during uh, during the 17th century. Uh, and my aim was really to reevaluate the involvement of these agents in the matrimonial practices of Catholics and approach them not merely as the enemies of the missionaries or the enemies of the Catholic, Catholic faith, the problems you have to kind of deal with, right? But, but as agents who were really active uh, in shaping the local dynamics of, of, Catholic, of Catholic daily life. And through the analyzed cases, I wanted to demonstrate the complexity uh, of these interactions between this communal representative and the subject population how they used and abused and the legal choices at their, uh, at their disposal and how all this of course affected uh, the implementation of Tridentine reforms and, uh, and the reinforcement of Catholicism in the region. And as Tiana said at the, at the very beginning, of course, we were all asked to, to address uh, to what extent what the, the transformations and, and the uh, religious uh, interactions and uh, legal mimicry and, and all, these, all, these, all these dynamics um, can we can we really call confessional, or can we use confessionalization in, in any in any meaningful in any meaningful way? And in my case, and I think this was the case for for several for several other for several other papers. So there is always this problem that we need to detach the concept a little bit from the written tradition of of, of confessions and really look at how how actually people on the ground tried to make sense at. Uh, uh, from all these like uh, possibilities uh, they were they were presented with. And uh, one more thing, of course, in terms of my sources that I have been dealing with, of course, the biggest pool came from Catholic missionary letters and reports in Latin and Italian, both published uh, and, and unpublished, and, uh, and they were cross-read with various translated and, and, and published uh, Ottoman, Ottoman sources, mostly various sultanic decrees uh, and, and, and legal, legal certificates. And what I would like to emphasize uh, about, about these sources that uh, they are very important, not just to, not just to get a glimpse of the, uh, in the daily lives of Catholics, but they are very essential and they uh, really contain indispensable information about local demography, taxation, uh, the relationship among uh, various uh, 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 Ottoman local, local authorities, uh, Various crises some territory was was, was facing. So 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 these the the, the untapped potential of these sources is very important, not just for Europeanists, so to say, or people who are dealing with Catholic missions, but but also for people who are interested, for instance, in the in the dynamics of uh, Ottoman Ottoman provincial taxation, and um, and and so on. And. Uh, yeah, and one more thing, of course, we are we have been all dealing with all these all these languages and and all these uh, secondary literature in in a variety of, of of Slavic languages. In my case, it was Serbo-Croatian, Romanian, Hungarian, and 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 all these languages. And I, in Anna's case, and she brought all these sources <laughs> in in Armenian. So I think that this was also such a such a great and it is such a great uh, aspect uh, of our of our project. That not just in terms of primary sources, but also in terms of secondary literature, that that we are we are bringing bringing all the results of also regional studies uh, accessible to to a wider to a wider reading public, and I think that this is also also a very important contribution of this project. So thank you. I think these were the most important things from my part. Thank you very much, uh, Emesha. Um, and uh, now I think uh, Polina and Hassan will speak about the third, uh, our third deliverable, namely the source book. Thank you very much, Tiana. Um, I will begin and uh, Hassan will continue after a few minutes. So I would like to begin also by thanking um, 
Baki for inviting us. Thanking uh, Tiana and Terin for inviting Hassan and myself to collaborate and to um, so take part in this project. And of course, I would like to thank all of the translators and we've worked with a group in a very, very, very big and very diverse uh, group of people. Um, I would like to thank you. Many of you are in this audience as, as I see. So thank you for collaboration and thank you also for everything that I have learned from you about the difficulty and the art of translation and the texts that we have been working with have been challenging texts. Uh, some of them, as you can imagine, um, dealt with theological issues, with issues of ritual, of practice. So, and of course, languages have been challenging. Um, as Anna has already pointed out in her uh, presentation, we dealt with intricate texts like Armeno Turkish, um, bringing in both colloquial speech of the street and a theological terminology. And we had to find ways to bring it all into um, readable and accessible English. So it, it's been challenging and it's been also a lot of fun. Um, I know we're nearing the end of our first hour. So I would like to also thank everyone for uh, attention and I will be very brief so we can have some time for discussion. Uh, what I would like I think to point out about the source book is that it's been the vision of the source book has been inspired by um, the vision of the, um, the project as a whole and especially of the I think Etienne we can go back to the previous slide sorry and we, because uh, Hassan will talk about the table of contents and it might be distracting now. So um, the vision of this source book was inspired by the Entang Entangled Confessionalization uh, volume that uh, Tiana has uh, just introduced a little earlier. The idea was to make some of these texts with uh, which um, the authors of uh, those chapters have worked to make them accessible to um, a wider readership. Um, and to uh, both to introduce the kinds of genres that have shaped confessional politics in um, the early modern Ottoman Empire, and also to kind of help confess, help contextualize a very wide range of sources, just as Anna was saying, some of them are um, some kind of theological treatises, polemical works, which might be very difficult to deal with when they just are taken on their own. So we hope that the source book will um, provide readers with frameworks. And of course, something else that came up a lot in this presentation was the idea that confessional communities were not static, that they were formed in dialogue, uh, through dialogue, conflict, imitation, and so uh, something else that we uh, tried to show with the source book is just um, how much even on the level of um, um, uh, production of texts, there was interaction and entanglement between different communities. Um, and another point that I would like to make before um, getting into details uh, is uh, our attempt to look a little bit also beyond just the Ottoman realm and look at how confessional politics have shaped uh, texts, both sort of confessional politics beyond the Ottoman realm and also inter-imperial rivalries um, have also um, shaped these texts. Um, just now to get a little bit into the concrete details, we have about um, 80, more than 80, um, texts. Most of them are in Persian, Arabic, in Turkish, Armenian, Greek, Armenian, Turkish, and a few are in Latin and Hebrew. Um, we tried to, uh, some sources we obviously could not include uh, in total because they're too long, so we had to abridge many of our sources. Some we, like letters, we include in their entirety. And uh, our editorial policy was to try and stick as closely as possible to the language um, of the original, of course, that um, we just had to strike a balance between making it readable in English, but also close to the original. But we, we tried to get the readers um, to uh, really feel the original language, sometimes at the price of um, certain awkwardness and difficulty, I would say. Um, but of course, this will be up to 
the readers to uh, judge our effort. Uh, we also would like to um, include in the source book a glossary, which we hope will be very um, helpful for the readers, a glossary of confessional terms or key terms that uh, keep coming up in some of these texts. Um, we will provide both definitions suggested by our texts, but also provide uh, kind of an index for the readers to go back to the original texts and be able to uh, see the contexts for themselves. I think that this is all that I would like to say. I would rather answer questions later and I will pass it on to Hassan who will discuss um, our table of contacts. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Polina. Uh, I also would like to start by thanking Bakoja for this kind invitation. And uh, as Polina did, I also should express my gratitude to Tiana and Dirin for their all support. Uh, uh, thanks to postdoctoral fellowship in this project. As a historian of astronomy, I obtained a new intellectual and acad academic interest, which has indeed provided me with new insights into my main fields of research. Actually, they proved that a historian of science could convert to a historian of Ottoman con confessionalization. So along with source book, uh, this source book, I had a chance to do research on early modern Ottoman cosmologies from the perspective of uh, confessionalization. It has been and is a great learning process. And of course, I'm uh, very thankful to Polina as well for her invaluable con collaboration in the source book project, of course, along with Tiana and Derin. So um, as uh, Polina has already remarked, it's a huge project with many translations made from several languages and uh, with many uh, uh, contributors. So our aim here is to make those translations available in a useful format and by emphasizing their interconnectedness with respect to certain themes. So we have decided to classify the translations not based on languages or confessional groups, but based on certain subjects, which we think represent some of the main interests of research in the field. We hope that this will be more user-friendly and will address in a proper way certain historiographic and source-based currents in confessionalization studies in general and in Ottoman confessionalization studies in particular. So we have different sources uh, like fetvas, letters, history books, reports, scholarly texts, hagiographies, heresiography literature, theological works, catechisms, and many others. So uh, if you look at the, um, the main um, sections of the source book, so as you see on the slide, we have six main sections in the source book. So the first one is related to creeds Confessional, confessions, catechisms, or ilmihals. So it includes representative examples as to the borders of knowledge to be conveyed to larger confessional groups. So the section, uh, the second section is uh, related to polemical works on orthodoxy and orthopraxy. And we have interesting uh, examples of how intracommunal and interconfessional polemics were conveyed in the early modern period, Ottoman period. And the third section will include examples, important examples, of course, of how conversions were accounted in different sources. Uh, for the fourth section, you see uh, the title programs of correcting uh, false practices and beliefs. So it provides interesting example, examples as to how the ruling and religious elites envisioned the social consolidation of their creeds or piety-related practices. So the, the fifth section is um, a, a, about narratives of investigation and persecution, and it has examples, important texts uh, produced in different confessional groups in the Ottoman period, of course. And the sixth, uh, sixth and last section has to do with, with blurring of boundaries, confessional ambiguity, and transconfessionality, and we have examples regarding attempts for the social, political, and confessional convergences. So um, I should emphasize that most of those texts will be available for the first time in English, uh, 
And each chapter is prepared with a pedagogical concern as each of them has useful introduction to the translation followed by useful for the reading list. And we are very grateful to each of our translators who have made very invaluable contributions. They have been so kind and open to addressing our editorial demands and requests of uh, revising the translations sometimes several times. And on behalf of the editorial board, I would like to express our gratitude to each of them. We were actually very privileged to work with such a great team. And thank you very much. And here you see their names. Uh, meanwhile, uh, I should also add that we expect to receive a few more new translations. So this list uh, will be more likely richer. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hassan. And that I think concludes our presentation. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to your questions. So thank you very much. I will stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tiana, for leading this amazing, amazing team with Dirin. You really raised the bar uh, in Ottoman historiography it, 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 by really bringing in uh, all communities together and actually uh, focusing on themes and comparisons uh, more than the actual communities uh, in your units. I mean, that is really where we need it to be. Thank you. Uh, I am sure people have questions here. I have some too, uh, but I, I'd like to just give everybody a moment to formulate their questions. You, if you are not camera shy, please use your uh, you know, reaction button, raise hand. And the first person who raises hand gets to have the first question asked on camera. If you are camera shy, write your questions on chat and I'll read them uh, for the YouTube, uh, you know, recording uh, purposes so that the question is understood. And then I have, uh, I'm just going to try something uh, to simply, you know, take the spirit of the this team, the you know the the cooperation spirit uh, to a level of YouTube registry. I'm wondering whether we could have a picture on the gallery view of everybody uh, in this team together to use in the YouTube as a thumbnail. So let me see. Okay, actually this is great. This is great. If a few more people could turn on their cameras and uh, fill the screen, I would appreciate it. Then we'll have uh, a good moment here. Okay, wonderful. I really, really appreciate this. Now, now keep it, uh, and then I'm gonna go to full screen for a moment, and I will also use the print screen function so that I can get a uh, shot. Smile. Well, okay. I hope some of you did screenshots too, because sometimes mine works, sometimes doesn't it would be a, a very shame to miss this moment. Uh, all right, I'm gonna just now go back to my other gallery view for a second, exit full screen, take one more shot just in case. All right, this one worked for sure. One more, thank you, thank you. Now, any hands up or any questions coming uh, if there aren't at this moment, I'll just go ahead myself, use my, uh, oh, Nir's hand is up. Nir, please, please go ahead. Hey, hi, everyone. Sorry to um, ask a question as part of the panel. Uh, Tiana and Derin, I wanted to ask you, um, I noticed in the title of the volumes, I think you've avoided the term confessionalization. And I think you've gone through a lot of uh, work to you know, explain how we're using it, how it's not an application, et cetera. Um, if you had to do this project all over again, you know, say you're seven years ago, would you keep using the term confessionalization or would it just be about historicizing Sunnism and uh, about looking at entanglements? Do you think in the end that it was more difficult to try to apply this term to Ottoman history uh, and to justify it? Or do you think that uh, in the end it was worth the effort? Darin, do you want to say something first? Or? Go ahead, Tianajan. 
since you wrote a whole piece on this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, thanks, Nir, for asking this question, even though, of course, it is the uh, kind of elephant uh, in the room. Um, after spending, uh, you know, uh, almost a year and a half writing this uh, essay and thinking about it, uh, I think that ultimately it was a productive concept uh, that uh, really helped us um, come together um, in order to, to uh, focus our, our thoughts and, and research and also to understand how uh, different commun communal experiences were different. So, uh, in the pro in, in in retrospect, yes, uh, I think I I, I also uh, came up with some alternative vocabulary that I thought uh, could be also useful to to use um, uh, to move away from, of course, the European and, and Christianocentric baggage of that term. Um, and in this essay, I, I talk about it. Uh, the term in question is normative centering. Um, and you can look it up and see why, but uh, um, um, ultimately, yes, I would say that uh, it was productive, uh, that it helped us get somehow on the same page uh, and uh, bring these communities into the uh, framework that helped us um, sort of flesh out uh, various uh, shared dynamics but also, uh, of course, uh, highlighted the limited nature of it, uh, the overemphasis on belief as opposed to practice, etc., and the needs for other terms as well in our larger toolbox. So that's where I'll stop. But yeah, the, the, the short answer is yes. Do you want me to say something as well? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I, I I would agree. I think it is um, it was a useful, productive uh, term or set of terms, you know, that came with this whole um, discussion. Uh, I mean, confession building or confessionalization, confessionalism. I think one of the advantages uh, that Tiana I think already mentioned is that these terms ma made it possible for us to talk about you know developments in different communities. Uh, so you can talk about Sunnitization, Shiitization, this that. Uh, but now you, we had this uh, we had this um, term or you know a, a set of terms uh, with which to refer to. Um, you know, comparable, though not identical, processes that, that we could observe in different uh, communities. So for that purpose, it was useful. And, and of course, um, we became more and more aware of the limitations of each of these concepts. Of course, one could say that about Sunnitization, Shiitization, all these concepts, right? I and mean, all concepts have have uh, uses, but also uh, limitations. Um, I personally uh, feel a little bit more uh, comfortable using the weaker definition of confessionalization and thus tend to, you know, use confession building rather than confessionalization just, just because, just because the, the latter term comes with a greater baggage. But as long as, in any case, as long as one talks about, um, you know, uh, the limitations of, 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 you know, either concept, uh, I, I think it's, uh, you know, I personally don't have a problem, uh, you know, using uh, using either, as long as you know I can uh, specify in which sense I use it and in what in which ways it 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 kind of functions as a good descriptor and in which ways it doesn't. Thank you, thank you so much. I have a question for. Anna and Amesha, uh, and it is related to uh, something that I'm very ignorant about, uh, but uh, the, the building of the Catholic Armenian community did in your research, I think in your research, you focus more in the 17th century, but did things come up that could uh, relate to how Catholicism started spreading among Ottoman Armenians? Was it more 18th century perhaps and so maybe 17 is too early is there anything you could share on this i uh, am curious simply because i i was doing a, a sort of a reading course on uh, modern turkish literature in which we read the akadi hikayesi 
and there, uh, you know, the tensions that were in the 19th century probably predates the beginnings of them to an earlier period. Uh, was there anything that uh, in this project came out about that? Yeah, so I uh, I believe I should start right, Emesha, because Akapa is a is a something written in nineteenth century um, uh, in Armenian Turkish, and by the way, it was uh, translated into Armenian. Um, I think in nineteen eighties, but it has never uh, published. Yeah, and. Um, so the we have the manuscript of the translator, but, but we don't have um, the the publication itself. Yes, yes, uh, the tension in Agape uh, described and introduced in Agape, it was there in seventeenth century. It was there in eighteenth century, and even before. In starting from, I mean, um, the relations with the with the Catholics um, started. Uh, long before 17th century it well, it started in Cilician period even when Armenians engaged with uh, uh, with Latins uh, when Armenian um, um, uh, Holy See the, the Catholic Crusade was um, relocated in Cilicia and uh, in her in Romkale or Romkla and uh, uh, all this you know um, communication that started uh, in um, since um, 12th uh, century, but the Armenian um, Catholic um, uh, community or Armenian Catholic Church is a product product of, of the uh, 18th century. Uh, the tension started uh, uh, late uh, in the 17th century and at, at the turn of 18th century, actually, and uh, I myself and uh, uh, Cesare Santos, who also contributed to the volume uh, that Tiana introduced, we both actually um, address this question and we touch upon the uh, upon uh, upon these things upon the tensions in uh, within the, the the Armenian communities. Um, and my own article is uh, actually dedicated to these tensions that started uh, at the turn of uh, 18th century between Armenian apostolic uh, faithful and Armenian Catholic faithful. So um, um, this was a very dramatic actually period because um, um, the, uh, the apogee was in, uh, of these tensions was um, in Constantinople, and uh, it ended uh, with uh, uh, martyrologies, um, like I talked about Yeremia Kyomurjan, his brother Komitas Kyomurjan was uh, um, executed by Ottoman authorities uh, uh, in result of those tensions that uh, burst actually out uh, between Armenian apostolics and Armenian, uh, Armenian Catholics and this was the part of uh, of uh, and this this played actually a great role in uh, redefining or reaffirming of Armenian Armenian apostolic orthodoxy and orthopraxy and was a huge part of it uh, because Armenian polemics was um, actually the, the the vector of Armenian polemics was in, uh, more internal than, than external. It was directed uh, against confessional others and against Armenian Catholics, not, not Catholics in general, but Armenian Catholics, the uh, inner source of enemy. So uh, mm, yes, my answer is that uh, the tension started uh, even before 19th century and the, they escalated and they reached 19th century and um, um, uh, they uh, uh, became part of this uh, refashioning of Armenian orthodoxy. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. I'll be looking forward to your contribution. <clears throat> uh, the, once uh, the uh, volume is published, I really, really appreciate this because this also came up uh, around the topic of um, 
um, uh, Dawson's uh, book that we discussed in an earlier WhatsApp, uh, Enlightening Europe on Islam and the Ottomans, Muraja Dawson and his masterpiece. <clears throat> Sebu Aslanian uh, was a, a commentator on that on that talk, and uh, what he noticed was that even though uh, he was Dawson was such a major sort of scholar uh, on the Ottoman Empire, he did not seem to have left a lot of uh, sort of resonance in Apostolic Armenian community as a member of the Catholic Armenian community. That is how it appeared, and I'm specifically interested <clears throat> how this is in history sort of uh, the, the uh, relations work because unlike uh, sort of Sunni Muslims within the Ottoman Empire who actually came to see a different version of Islam as equally good, as equally acceptable, that never happened. Uh, Alevis are always remained sort of a, the other in the Ottoman realm. And even today in Turkey, the recognition of Jemevis continue to be a, a major issue. Uh, <clears throat> I, I'm curious how this relationship worked among Armenians because I, I tend to think secularism really develops more from <clears throat> uh, sort of within the tradition by the recognition of uh, other versions of the same religion rather than, uh, uh, you know, so much, not so much through uh, respecting totally other religions. Of course, that's very important too, but recognition of a different tradition within the same group is very significant to me. And I'm just really curious how that played out while, Ottomans, uh, while Ottoman Armenians were living under Ottoman rule. And then if anything, how that relationship continued. But I'm gonna stop here because this is just a, a, a curiosity of mine. Um, I don't see any other hands raised up. I don't see any other thing on the chat. Uh, then, uh, I have one more question, sort of very general to Tiana and uh, Derin. The, one, <clears throat> how did all of this work, keeping all, so many different parts of this project afloat, going, uh, governing so many different things at the same time uh, with so many players, how did it affect your own research over the last years? I'm sure uh, it must have taken a toll. Uh, and uh, two, the, did you receive any responses, any sort of reactions from scholars in <clears throat> Turkey who study Islam at uh, Ilahiyat uh, faculties, uh, you know, the, the faculties of theology? How, how uh, did, was your work received by them so far, as far as you can tell? Uh, please. No, Darren, should I start? Or do you? Oh, sorry, please. Yeah, okay, well, um, thank you, Baki. Uh, I mean, it was an incredible experience. You know, uh, we are just not trained. I think, uh, you know, most of us are trained uh, here. Uh, well, many of us on the project were trained in the US and, you know, you don't necessarily have this uh, tradition of working on a joint project, which is kind of a science model. And, and so it was a big adjustment, figuring out how to do this, how to, uh, how to manage. I mean, uh, of course, it, it, it was a learning process as we went, uh, but it was uh, helpful to have a lot of people in one place in Budapest for a while. So a lot of people were actually physically together and we were able to have uh, meetings like that. Um, for Derin and me, it was incredible to spend a year together in um, mm -hmm. Wissenschaftskolleg in Berlin, uh, which was a, a pure gift, I think, it was just really gave us opportunity to not only talk every day, but go for long walks and just brainstorm. And it was it was just, uh, uh, you know, one of the great things about this project, this, this time to think. Uh, so um, it, it made possible, I think, to digest a lot of things that that seemed so confusing and, and seemed like, you know, it, 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 it has been a lot to process. And I think that's why, I mean, we kind of expected ourselves to be faster. Both Darren and I wanted to write our own books in the process. However, this editorial process, as, as also Nir said, 
you know, it was more than editing. It was constant learning through conversation, through email. Uh, every time you reach out to someone, you actually learn something else. Then you adjust everything. And it was, I mean, it was, it was, uh, you know, I don't know. I'm still recovering <laughs> from the whole thing. It's, it's not, it's not uh, something that will become clear, I think, for, for a few more years. Uh, but, but yes, uh, it, that, it did mean that a lot more time was spent on um, talking and editing and thinking together than on working on our own uh, research. And so I personally am now looking forward to actually starting writing my own book because um, there was absolutely no time for that during the project. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I won't add anything to what Tiana said on, on the topic of uh, <laughs> organization. I mean, she has, Tiana has formidable organizational skills, by the way. Um, I could not say the same about myself. Um, uh, but uh, yes, I think she said whatever it needs to be said. Uh, I'll just take this, uh, the second question that you had uh, about the response to our work. As, 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 as I think Tiana mentioned, we, we, no one has written a review of, 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 the, uh, of the book. So, um, so we don't have you know, a, a whole lot of uh, evidence on which to base our impressions. Uh, but in general, um, I would find it difficult to um, make a kind of blanket statement, <laughs> uh, particularly in the absence of you know, actual <laughs> engagement. I would find it difficult to make a blanket statement about you know, like positive or negative responses coming more from you know, people with, uh, with an Ilahiyat background. Hmm? Some people actually uh, are quite, you know, uh, you know, with with an Ilahiyat training, uh, the, the younger generation especially are actually quite open to uh, thinking about some of these issues historically. Um, and yeah, I've had people uh, express interest uh, in, you know, some of what I'm doing. Others basically uh, trivialize uh, or ignore uh, <laughs> what we've written. That's also very, very common, uh, or just you know reduce it to some little thing. Yeah, so uh, I, I would find uh, it difficult to generalize, basically. Thank you, thank you, Dirin. Uh, Nir's hand is up. Nir, please go ahead. Um, yeah, sorry to keep talking, but I just figured since uh, there's to generate more questions. Um, uh, one, the one thing I wanted to add is what's special about this volume, and I think which is unique, at least that hasn't been done before in Ottoman history, is that it really actually engages very deeply with what um, would normally consider Islamic studies, right? Uh, the kind of Nelk side of a, of a, you know, the history of the Near East or history of the Middle East program. Uh, things that I think, at least in Ottoman history, hasn't been heavily engaged with before until recently, only now that we've moved into cultural history, have those topics been open? And often Ottoman historians have done it in a super, somewhat superficial way. I know that I myself wasn't trained in, you know, reading classical Arabic texts or going through Islamic theology. But uh, one of the things that Darin and Tiana were very good at doing is kind of forcing us as contributors to engage and delve into every possible aspect uh, of, of, of many of these things. And so I think this is really one of the first books that ideally should be respected and uh, seen as kind of uh, almost uh, intellectual or cultural history of uh, kind of post-classical Islam, if you will, at least the, the first one, uh, not the, the other entangled confessionalizations. Uh, anyways, my question, again, is just, I'm just coming up with broad questions to ask uh, either the whole panel or to Derin and Tiana. Uh, now that you've finished this kind of seven years of projects and you, you know, have a sense of what is the history of religion for the empire. I was just wondering if you think uh, two things. One, is there anything you wanted to get to that you weren't able to, like some new paths that opened up that just weren't, you didn't see when you started the project. So after, you know, going through all these Armenian and Greek sources and Slavic and, and all these other problems, uh, you see now that this is kind of a future pathway for, for the field or for uh, the history of religion in the Ottoman Empire. Um, maybe you can just list like two things, I guess. Sh sh 
shall I? Okay, I mean, one thing that I think uh, we have not explored, and in general, uh, it, one thing that Ottomanists in, in general have not explored in the field is, uh, you know, regional uh, social studies of religion. I think we really lack that. That is not something I wish I could do because I'm not sure I have the, you know, right skills for it. I think that could be an entire project in and of itself, but we inclined from the beginning more in the direction of intellectual history and social history, of political history of ideas and so forth. Uh, uh, but I think, you know, one could uh, uh, in the future um, do these more rigorous uh, uh, studies of a small region, yeah, uh, um, with a focus on confessional politics, making use of all kinds of sources, not just uh, you know, religious, but not tahris and stuff, uh, hagiographies. I think that would be fascinating. Uh, that's what we lack, right? And that's what, uh, you know, the, the, the field of Central European history or, uh, you know, German history with an emphasis on confession building and whatnot uh, has a great deal of. So we, we lack that. Uh, that's one thing that I would, um, um, that I would mention. In general, I think for me, you know, this is not quite an answer <laughs> to your question, but kind of looking back and thinking about what I've gotten out of this, out of this whole experience, I've learned a lot, of course. Um, it, it has been a, a, a kind of a second or third education for me, <laughs> basically. Starting to teach was uh, one, and, and then this project, I think, was like a third major <laughs> educational track for me. Um, anyway, apart from learning about all, you know, all these different communities and, and the similarities and differences and entanglements, I think for me, it meant, uh, in some sense, going back to my early work, which I never published, <laughs> you know, a work on Masri and, and revisit it in a new light. And that is, you know, um, that's, that's been very important. It's, 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 how I have gone back to it will be apparent more in this in this article that that and I have begun to how I have begun to rethink some aspects of it will become more apparent in this in this essay that I wrote for the second volume and I hope to you know uh, uh, go uh, more in that direction and it has also uh, but this is a different. Uh, uh, matter. It has this whole experience of thinking about Sufis and politics and Ottoman political culture. Um, it has made me rethink Baki's thesis about constitutionalism. Uh, and, and I'd love to have a conversation with him about that in the future, but I, I don't want to get into it now. Thank you. Just, just Thank briefly. You. Diana, would you like to add something? Yeah, I, I can um, add something from the perspective of, of my own um, sort of interest that uh, it's certainly provincial differences or regional differences, of course, emerged as an important issue. And, and I wish we had a way or uh, time to deal with that uh, um, in greater detail. In particular, what tickled my imagination were various um, library collections from particular locations which could tell us something about the sort of local ecologies both manuscript ecologies and 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 kind of confessional sensibilities that that they they were um they they were intertwined with so that that would have been one one thing i wish we could have explored more um the second thing was uh, more simply knowing about you know people on the ground preachers imams why are they there who's not there why are they not there uh, uh, how many of them are there you know just simply a lot of questions to which it's very hard to get answers and the you know we we've talked about uh, this uh, also with the uh, with various students I, I know i see maria kiprovska is here with maria we've discussed this how do you you know how do you locate imams in the in the various sources which sources do we need to you know sort of pair in order to get certain answers about about them and 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 so yeah these 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 are the things i would live like to know more about uh, but that would have requ required i think different also methodological approach and more time and different team thanks thank you 
Thank you, Tiana. Now, uh, I don't see any hands and nothing in the chat. And we are actually already uh, six minutes after the time we thought we would end this after 90 minutes of starting. So uh, I, what I'll say is those of you who are interested in talking about the results of the OTSA ballot, please stay on. Um, I'm happy to listen um, to uh, your feedback, uh, to your questions, etc. Uh, but for everyone else, uh, we are ending here and I'm going to stop recording, just uh, waving goodbye for YouTube here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Tiana. Thank you, Devin. Thank you, Baki, so much. And thank Goodbye. you, everyone. It's so lovely to see all these familiar faces. I just wish we could all meet somewhere in person soon. So until then. Come to Australia. Inshallah. Inshallah, <laughs> we'll meet in person. Have a wonderful week.